Welcome to another amazing podcast from Encounter City Church. To stay connected, you can find us on Facebook or go to www.encountercitychurch.com.au. We pray that you have a fresh encounter with Jesus today. So, John 8, 31 to 36. Jesus said to the people who, be, who believe in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is a part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. So a little bit of my background. For those of you that don't know, I'm fairly fortunate to be one of four generations of my family that are here in this church. My grandmother got saved rather recently. Got baptised last year. Was it last year? Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> but I grew up in a family that went to church. It almost, I, would, I was going to say it's almost perfect. I'm like the most perfect example of that. But my mother will tell you that, that was not, that's not true. But, but I grew up in a good family. Not every want was ever taken care of, but every need that we had was taken care of. My parents worked hard to provide for us. They, they grew us up, they taught us, they trained us. We, we were brought up coming to church every Sunday. It was one thing that was never a negotiable. My parents said to me... And, if you live under my roof, you will go to church on Sunday. And it is something to this day that I am very, very thankful and want to honour my parents for making that stand. I grew up knowing who God was. I grew up in a family that prayed together, a family that we were read Bible stories as kids. We were taught there was... My, I inherit my singing voice from my mum. I also inherit my gusto from my mum. So if you sit ne- stand next to us, you will certainly hear us. <laughs> but it might not be the most in tune. <laughs> but my mum taught me that I wasn't singing for other people around me, but I was singing to God. I have a saying, what I lack in ability, I make up in volume. And if you stand next to me, you know how true that is. So I grew up to know who God was. I knew that God was real. I knew that Jesus died on the cross for me. That God sent his only son to pay the price of my sins. I knew what sin was. I knew that my sins separated me from God. I made a decision at a young age to follow Jesus. I was filled with the, with the Spirit and spoken tongues in kids' church. Yet, I got to an age. I got to my teenage years. And I've shared my, my story before, but my story is still ongoing. It's not done. I'm just in the... I've just got what's coming. But, but this part of my story culminates with me at the, about the age of 19, 18, 19, culminates with me crying out to God in a laneway here in Garraway. But how I got from a kid in church knowing who God was, being on fire for God, to being a kid, that, a young man that was broken in a laneway in Garraway, crying out to God didn't happen overnight. It started as a process. I allowed things to come into my life. I allowed things to come in 
and I made compromises. Pastor Phil preached a message a few weeks ago about staying out of the woods. I started flirting with those woods. First thing that's, one of the first things that came through was my language. I could come to church, I could come home and speak really, generally pretty well. Language wouldn't generally slip out. Sometimes it would, but if I went to school and was around my mates, some of the language that I used would have put builders that I've worked to, with to shame. I made a compromise. I got later in, later on, I began to start entertaining thoughts, start doing things that was not of God. I allowed drinking to come into it. Drinking for the purpose of getting drunk. My parents can recall times that had come to pick me up covered in my own vomit. Yet, at that time, if you had asked me, was I a Christian, I would have said yes. I sat there and I looked at myself and I go, yeah, I know who God is. But I had lost, lost my way. It wasn't until one day dealing with depression, my parents not knowing what to do with me. One day I was sitting in a lane, uh, like sitting in my bedroom, not able to move. My parents had no clue what to do. They ring up the church, ring up this, the pastor at the church and go, can you come down? Can you come and talk to him? We don't know what to do with him. He comes, gets me, I go, go for a walk with him. And I'm walking through him. To this day, I cannot tell you what was said on that walk. Would not have a clue. But the moment that I remember, I remember realising how far away from God I had gone. Not, this didn't happen as one big leap. It had it happened as a bunch of compromises. I did not consciously wake up one day and go, no, I don't no longer believe in God. It happened because I lost my way. For those of you that don't know, I'm an electrician by trade. I have the privilege now of teaching my trade to year 11 and 12 students. It is one of, I reckon it's an amazing job. I love being able to impart knowledge. But as an electrician, we use a whole bunch of meters. I've got one sitting here for demonstration. This one here is a multifunction tester that allows, takes place of multiple things. I also got another one that sits right here, nice little, known as a volt stick. This thing allows us to put it up in next to power and see it glow. I don't know if anyone follows what's going on, anything in the news at the moment, but people might recognise this brand. This brand's been recently recalled due to a fault. We, as electricians, the only way for us to tell if something's live is to test it. But what happens if what we're testing with isn't working? Multimeters, meters, all that need to be calibrated. When something is calibrated, it is, it is set against a measured value, against an accurate and measured value, against a known source. So, so this meter gets sent off to be calibrated. They, te they check it, test it against a known source. Make sure that it is reading accurately, that it is not faulty and it is not misaligned. We have a rule and something that I drum into my students that this is the difference between life and death. That this is the difference between life and death. If it is not working, then how you can cut into a cable not knowing whether it's live or dead. We have, the rule goes, we test this. 
we test what we're about to cut, then we test this again. This gets tested twice while what we're going to cut te gets tested once. We want to make sure that this is working. We want to make sure that it's working, and then we check, then we make sure that it's still working. Calibration is not a one and done thing. We don't calibrate this at manufacture and then keep using it for the next 20 years. If we do, it's going to find a fault over the time. We have to send it off regularly to be recalibrated. When they recalibrate it, they take it and they check it. So if they're recalibrating for a resistance test, they ch check it against a known resistor value. Make sure that it is reading accurately. It needs to be measured against a known and precise value. It's the same with our lives. In our lives, we calibrate our senses. We, we, we look at it, we go and calibrate against a known source. But what is our source? What are we calibrating to? If I decide to take this and I calibrate it to a resistor or something that is said to be one value but is actually measuring at a different value, what's going to happen to this? Is it going to measure accurately? No. So what is that, what are we calibrating? John 8, 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In recent times, this is one of the most misquoted, misunderstood verses that I've heard. I've heard so many people quote this verse with the whole context of the verse wrong. People set their own calibration. Charles Spurgeon said, the greatest enemy to, the human, to human souls is the self-righteous spirit which makes, which makes them look to themselves for salvation. We calibrate against God. We've got to come to a true and accurate source. The world today tells us to make our own truth. Truth is, is a variable. Whatever makes you happy is your truth. I have heard so many people say, but what is your truth? It's a bit of an oxymoron. You cannot have more than one truth. There is only one truth. John 14, 6, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He didn't say, I am a way, a truth, and the life. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. So what are you calibrating against? What am I calibrating against? What source am I using? Am I using my own personal pleasure? Am I using my own personal gain? Am I calibrating against what celebrities we look at? Because nowadays, if you look at celebrities, they are coming out and saying, this is my truth. This is my truth. We need to go to the source. We need a direct and accurate source. There is only one direct and accurate source. How often do I need to recalibrate? If I was going to church every Sunday, as a youngster, I was attending church every Sunday. I'd go to youth. I'd do everything on the outward. But my calibration had lost because I had made compromises. 
I hadn't actually seeked the source. I had allowed myself to be that source. I, I checked my calibration against my mates. My mates were on the same pathway that I was, so my calibration, according to them, checked out. But I never went back to the source. But Sunday comes but once a week. I don't know about you, I, I love my weekends, but I only get one of them a week. If your only source of calibration is on a Sunday, what's happening the other six days? Put it this way, actually. What's happening on the other six days and 22 hours? That is a long time that you're not in church compared to what the time that you are in church. How often do you need to eat? If you're my daughter, it is constantly, otherwise she gets hangry. She takes after her mother. How often do we need to drink water? How long can you survive without having anything to drink? Drinking water, you'll die quicker than without eating. Without not drinking water, you'll die quicker with not, than not eating. How often do you need to sleep? <laughs> oh, shit. Like mother, like daughter. How long can you go without sleep? You'll eventually fall down where you're standing and either die or go to sleep. So how often do you need to recalibrate? How often do we need to go back to the source? If we can survive about three days without fluids, how much more do we need the Word of God? How much more do we need to go back to that source to check where we're at? Personally, if we're eating every day, Three times a day. Four, four or five, six, seven, eight if you're my daughter. <laughs> how often do you need to recalibrate? But how do we do it? How do we actually manage to recalibrate? Why do we need to recalibrate? We need to recalibrate firstly because we... We are fallen. We are naturally sinners. Our human nature will always lead us astray. We go to work. The people that we're around, the majority of us, the people that we are around, do not have the same calibration as what we do. The people that we're around do not have the same values that we do. So what's going to knock your calibration out of sync? John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and, lo and have it to the full. As we go through life, our calibration gets knocked. It goes out. But we need to come to the source on a regular basis. But how do we go to the source? Spending time in the Word. Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the divide of bone and marrow, soul and spirit, discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Reading the Word, and not only just reading the Word, but living it. Anyone can sit there and read words on a page, but if you're not living it, it is not going to do anything for you. Yeah, Spending time in prayer. Most of us either 
have time, plenty of like downtime, either we're driving to work, we're, we're eating breakfast, sitting on the dunny, whatever it is, we have plenty of time. All the dads in the room know exactly what I mean about sitting on the dunny. <laughs> but we have time that we fill with other things. Why not spend that time in prayer? But just as important as that is spending time with prayer with others, with our families, with those around us, being, coming here, spending time with that, in our life groups, spending that time with others in corporate prayer. Never neglect praying together. Take opportunities as they arise. There are opportunities that arise when people have, that God will speak into your lives. Sometimes they take action. All of this takes action. Do you think that this meter will recalibrate itself by just sitting here on, the, on this stand? Do you think it will lose calibration just sitting here on this stand? Yes. But it will not gain calibration sitting here. It takes an action for me to physically pick it up, take it over and check it out and resource it. Do you think that this works without a battery in it? It will not work without a battery in it. It will not function without its source. There will come times that at an altar call, and I've been there, I've sat there in, in church, and the altar call, and you sit there, and you hear the word given, you hear the call made, and you sit there and go, oh, actually, I feel like it should be up there. Oh, hang on, I've been in this church for 18 years. What are people going to think if I go up the front? I know you think it, because I've thought it too. <laughs> I'm not saying anything today that... I'm not going through myself. I'm not preaching as someone that has, is calibrated and never needs to go back to being cal recalibrated. What I'm saying today is something that I have to live through my own, myself. Something that requires me to recalibrate daily. Gr growing up, Going through this time in my life, I allowed the things of myself to come through. I allowed the little things to, to disrupt my calibration. Take me away from God ever so slightly, one little step at a time, before I realised that there was a chasm between me and God. It was not something that happened instantly. It was something that happened over time. But I hit that moment in a laneway here in Girlwain, just around the corner from my parents' house. Laneway's, laneway's been cleaned up in a little bit more than it was now, but back then it was a dark, dingy, horrible laneway. But that was the moment in my life that I cried out to God. God met me in that moment. My stepping away from God was not instantaneous, but my recalibration to God was. It took me years to walk away. It took me a moment to come back. <laughs>